We often find ourselves wondering what great games might have come and gone without making much of a splash. Games that might not be especially well known, but are actually surprisingly good. Others might be hidden in plain sight, disliked or overlooked games in popular series that are actually much better than popular opinion gives them credit for, at least for some people. A list of hidden gems might not be anything all that original, but a lot of people have asked us for it and, you know, we thought it'd be a fun way to talk about some games that we haven't had a chance to discuss. So here's a look at four games that we consider to be hidden gems. Heading into this list, I had a hard time at first. What justifies a hidden gem? Well, it's a term that I think can be applied in different ways. This time around, I'd say that my choices actually fall under a more traditional meaning of the term. Anyways, let's get started. Released nearly simultaneously in 2008 on both the PlayStation 2 and Nintendo Wii, Heavenly Guardian began life as a sequel to Pocky and Rocky from the Super NES. Unfortunately, the developer, Starfish SD, lost the rights to the name, so instead of just scrapping the whole thing, they re-envisioned it as more of a spiritual successor. You play as a snow goddess named Sayuki, who is in love with a boy that she seems to be stalking. One day, he isn't at his normal place, and she goes and peeks into the window of his home. Turns out he's been cursed, and it's up to Sayuki to save him. Of course, that's going to entail blowing away tons of demons and stuff. <laughs> Heavenly Guardian is a mashup of cute em up and an overhead running gun. Hey, that sounds pretty cool, right? You run through seven levels, destroying everything in your path using various types of water-based elemental attacks. Different style attacks are represented by multicolored crystals. If you pick up several of the same color in a row, your attack power will increase. This little creature follows Sayuki on her quest, and shoots ice attacks that'll freeze enemies in place. But you can also let loose an icy wind attack that'll freeze multiple enemies at once. And last but not least, you have a dodge roll for when you find yourself in a situation and you need to make a quick escape. Early on, you can die pretty easily, but as you pick up life extenders, you can just tank through your hits due to the liberal dispersal of health items. This is one instance where the game becomes much easier as time goes on, and you become more powerful while enemies generally stay the same. Overall, Heavenly Guardian is an old school style game with some nice sprite work and a pretty catchy soundtrack. And yes, there is a two player simultaneous mode that not only has a completely different story, but also adds a little bit of friendly competition to the mix. If I had to pick one really annoying thing about the game, is that the levels themselves are way too long for their own good, sometimes lasting well over 15 minutes. I paid $8 shipped for the PS2 version on eBay, and the Wii version runs pretty much the same. If you absolutely have to play this game right now, it can also be downloaded as a PS2 classic on PlayStation 3 for 10 bucks. Under Defeat HD is an overhead shooter where you take command of a high-powered attack helicopter and blow up some bad guys. Released originally in the arcade, it was then ported to the Dreamcast in 2006. Yes, the Dreamcast in 2006. It made its way to HD systems in 2012 with lots of bells and whistles. You've got two main modes to play. Arcade mode sports the zoomed out vertical layout that most arcade shooters tend to have. And New Order mode, which redesigns and zooms everything in so it fills out the full 16x9 aspect of the screen. This is probably the best way to play, unless you can be bothered to rotate your monitor. 
Your chopper is equipped with the usual shoot 'em up fare a rapid fire machine gun, screen clearing napalm bombs, and finally, an option. There's three different kinds of these Vulcan, Cannon, and Rocket. If you refrain from attacking long enough for this gauge to fill up, the next time you shoot, the option will fly out and attack until the meter drains. You will need some fancy flying moves while you wait for that option gauge to fill up. Because things will get crazy. And with that insanity comes tons of slow down. Apparently this version added a bunch of slowdown to make the game more manageable. But it just looks kind of bad at times. I mean, hey, the Dreamcast version barely had any. At least make it a toggle to turn on and off. Since you're in a helicopter, you have a bit more freedom to move around. You'll make use of the entire screen real estate as you weave through bullets. There's various methods of control you can choose from when starting a new game, so you'll hopefully be able to find something that suits you. However, new to the HD version is a dual stick control option, where one stick moves and the other shoots. Once I realized that this was an option, I never looked back. With only five levels in total, Under Defeat HD can be beaten fairly quickly, but it's certainly not easy. In the US, Under Defeat HD was released at retail as a deluxe edition that includes all the patches and DLC on disc from the Japanese version. It also includes a pretty nice soundtrack CD that includes all the arranged tracks that are exclusive to this version. Under Defeat HD is also available for download on PSN and Xbox Live with all the DLC, but if you want that soundtrack, you're out of luck. Whoa, I guess I was in some sort of overhead shooter mood when I made my choices for this episode. I didn't even realize it until now. Moving on, let's check out Tri's selections. So I took a bit of a different approach with my picks. These are games that you definitely know about, but you've probably heard more negativity than praise. So I want to challenge that view. Any idea what this is? Ninja Ryukenden 3. It's the Japanese version of Ninja Gaiden 3, the ancient ship of doom. Not exactly an unknown game, but not as well loved as its predecessors. Even within a series that's famous for its difficulty, Ninja Gaiden 3 is difficult for all the wrong reasons. Not only are Ryu's defenses paper thin, but the infinite continues that made Ninja Gaiden 1 and 2 beatable are reduced to a handful of limited continues. But I want to suggest that Ninja Gaiden 3, or rather Ninja Ryukenden 3, is actually the best game in the series. See, here's the difference if you play the Famicom version. Enemies deal normal damage, you've got the infinite continues that are a staple of the series, and Tecmo even added a password system so you don't have to leave your console on overnight. And you're gonna need it, because it's a tough game. Maybe tougher than the first two NES games, but it's a better kind of tough. One major improvement is that if you kill an enemy, it will never respawn unless you die too. Yeah. After dealing with birds constantly respawning at the edge of the screen in Ninja Gaiden 1, you gotta admit, this is pretty nice. Level design and enemy placement is also a lot more intentional. Sure, it looks brutal at a glance, but once you start to figure out a level, there's a great flow to it that other Ninja Gaidens don't quite match. You'll learn how to best dispatch every incoming threat, and if you run across a particular ninjutsu item, well, it's probably not just there for no reason. It might be helpful for the next few jumps. 
Ryu's most prominent new ability is hanging from underneath certain platforms, which definitely adds a fun bit of ninja acrobatics to the mix. Ryu's jump is a bit floatier than the previous games, which I'd argue actually feels a bit better. So yeah, if you always regretted that you never finished the full Ninja Gaiden NES trilogy, the Japanese version is better and cheaper. Give it a try! Castlevania just never got 3D right. Or did it? If we look at where Castlevania went through the 2000s, we can look back on the earliest attempt at 3D Castlevania gameplay in a fresh light. The game that's commonly referred to as Castlevania 64 is in fact just called Castlevania. It was released in early 1999, and admittedly feels like a far earlier N64 game. But looking beyond the awkward button mapping, troublesome camera, and slowdown, I think there's a game of some merit here. I mean look, what other 3D Castlevania game actually put in traditional platforming challenges? And believe it or not, I feel like this aspect of Castlevania 64 actually works really well. But it's clear that the development team struggled to execute their vision, and that's why at the very end of 1999, another Castlevania released on the N64, Legacy of Darkness. This is much less like a new game, and more like a director's cut of Castlevania 64. Which was perhaps disappointing at the time, but in retrospect, this could be the most complete 3D Castlevania experience we ever got. In addition to new characters, Legacy of Darkness features the campaigns of Vampire Hunter Reinhardt and Magician Carrie from the previous game, along with smart tweaks to the game design, improved camera angles, and better optimized performance. Though I'll admit that I did actually enjoy Lament of Innocence and Lords of Shadow for what they are, the spirit of Castlevania is expressed far better through Konami's earliest fumblings in the 3D realm. The original version is very cheap and common, and I think it's worth giving a fair chance. Unfortunately, Legacy of Darkness is much harder to find, and currently sells for around $50. But just think about what could have been if the N64 take on 3D Castlevania gameplay had been better received. Instead of trying all sorts of ideas that didn't really feel like Castlevania, maybe Konami would have given us more of the action platforming that we expected. Maybe Konami wouldn't have gotten the idea that no one wanted Castlevania anymore just because they gave us Castlevania games that people didn't really want. Maybe Konami would still be a company that was interested in making video games. And it's all because everyone mistakenly thought Castlevania 64 was a bad game. Well, maybe. So, what did you think? Some of our choices might seem a bit unorthodox when it comes to the term hidden gem, but I think the general message comes across just fine. Just because a game isn't expensive or popular doesn't mean that it's bad. We've always liked going into games ready to deal with whatever limitations they might have, and whenever you do that, you might be surprised at what you find. <laughs> 